Hello, and welcome to another edition of Day Drinking with Kevin. I'm your host, Kevin McGuire. And today, as part of our Perspective series, we talk with Master of Wine, Robin Kick. Originally from Chicago, Illinois, Robin now lives in Switzerland. And she's only one of five Masters of Wine in the entire country. We're going to talk about her unique journey to become a Master of Wine, and maybe some helpful hints, tips, and suggestions for people that might be out there studying for the WSET or MW program. I can't wait to hear what she has to say. So Robin, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Um, this perspective series is very important to me personally because I've had an opportunity to speak to Master Sommeliers, Masters of Wine from all over the world about their unique journeys that caused them to become, you know, the highest level in our profession. And I think you have an amazing story and I really wanted the rest of the world to hear about it. So uh, oh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you very much for thinking of me and, and inviting me into your, your space and into your series. So um, you're talking to us from Merceau today, is that correct? Yeah, so I come to Burgundy regularly and I arrived, I don't know, last Thursday or so. Um, I'm working on a, I, ho hopefully, I haven't signed the contract just yet, but sort of a series of information on various, all the villages of Burgundy and um, other things for an educational course. Um, so hopefully that will be, the contract and everything will be fine. I think it will. And uh, so I, I love Burgundy. So it's um, the first place that I ever visited in 1990, way before I even thought about wine or working in wine. And I was a student uh, in, in France. I was living in Paris and my then boyfriend, I was an au pair for the summer and mm -hmm. he picked me up and, and he, it was his itinerary and we ended up in Beaune. And I had never heard of it. I didn't know it existed. And of course, you fall in love with the, the, the tile roofs. Uh, Bone is a beautiful city and a little city and, and the food and of course the wine. I still remember where we ate. I remember where we stayed. I don't remember the wine, uh, the exact wine, but I remember we had Coco Vin. I remember we had Epoise. <laughs> so, you know, from, from so long ago and it just sort of stuck. So I always viewed um, this place, I was fortunate enough to experience this sort of what many people consider the holy grail of wine. I was fortunate enough to uh, have that be my first proper winery, or, you know, vineyard area experience. Um, so yeah, fortunately, I do come here regularly since as well. I don't know anybody that has visited that area that doesn't come back completely mesmerized by uh, the history, the people, the food, the wine. It's, it's just an amazing place. I, I love it myself. Yeah, no, and the more you spend here, you know, everyone always knows that Burgundy is complex, complicated even. And of course, the more you spend here, the more you're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> it, 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 it's worse than you thought, you know? <laughs> It's like the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Um, and so, but, you know, you sort of chip away like a sculpture, you know, I'll get this, I'll get this. Uh, and it's great because it's one of those things that's always like a carrot, you know, it's, it, it, it's inspiring and it pulls you in the direction to learn. A bit like doing the Master of Wine, um, because you'll never know everything. It's absolutely impossible. And so uh, sometimes it's overwhelming. So it depends, like if you think about it, it's like, I just want to hide under a rock. Um, <laughs> there are days where it was like that. And it's like that if I try, some days where I try to learn about Burgundy or continue to learn about Burgundy. Um, but with, yeah, and then there's other days that are just like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to sort of jump in and, and try to start deciphering things and, you know, on um, unv unveiling things and so that I can understand how it works because I'm somebody, I always want to understand why I want to understand the connections because there's almost always a reason for everything. Some things we learn and some things we don't, but it's nice to act too of trying to understand it is what sort of drives me. So Robin, you became a master of wine in 2014? Correct. Yes. Let's go back before all that. Um, if I understand correctly, you were, um, you, um, 
you, you taught uh, at, a, at a university or something and and then um, decided, hey, I, I would rather get into the wine industry. How, how did that go? Because I'm someone who's quite a late bloomer. Um, I met had friends who were like, I'm going to be a doctor, I'm going to be a lawyer, I'm going to be whatever, you know, an archaeologist, you know, from a long, young age. And I always admired that because I just thought, geez, I'm so lost, I'm confused, I have no idea what I want to do. So I just was became like a perpetual student. And it was in the early 90s, and, you know, there was um, a really bad, the, the job market was very bad. And um, everyone was in recession. And so after I finished uh, college in 1992, I should have been 91, but I transferred. I had already lived in Paris, you know, uh, um, uh, twice, <laughs> going back and forth. So I lost a few credits. So I ended up graduating in 92. And, and then I was like, what do I want to do? I have no idea. I just knew I liked foreign cultures. I like foreign language. I like food. Um, the wine thing was early. I just assumed that that's what wine was about. I had no idea that it could get significantly grander than that. And so when I was um, uh, finishing college, I decided what to do. So I continued to study and I ended up studying a master's in French. And then immediately at the same time was doing a master's to teach English as a foreign language. Mm -hmm. So I did some, me yeah, so TESOL as well as linguistics. And so when I finished um, my master's degree, I taught for two years in the U.S., um, both in California in a town called Ojai, which is, um, has someone there as well, like Sinequinon is very famous and based there. But again, I wasn't in the wine business at the time. And then I did two years at the University of Nice teaching French to at the three different French universities. And I just found it a bit, as much as I loved France, um, I found that a lot of the students, they weren't motivated. And so when you're a teacher and your students aren't motivated, it's very it's flattening, you know, I wanted, it's not inspiring. And I just thought, okay, after two years of that, I said, I think I need to shift. And so I thought, where can I learn about wine? And of course I thought of Bone because that's the only place I really knew of at the time. I was in my mid twenties, maybe 27, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I decided to contact the BIDB which is the local marketing board for um, Burgundy Wine, because they had, and they still do, um, sort of teaching courses, or not, you know, not teaching courses, but courses to teach you about Burgundy. And so I did sort of the introduction to Burgundy Wine, which was a five-day course, and then I did a three-day uh, Grand Cru, and uh, one, we had every Grand Cru except Romani Conti, of course, just one example of each. Uh, which I thought was great. Um, but, you know, it's overwhelming and you don't really know when it was just the beginning for me. So when I did that, I asked, I said, oh, this might be in my head. I mean, this might be it because I love the passion behind it. I love tasting. Ever since I was small, I was obsessed with smell. Uh, my mother used to cook and bake a lot. And so she would always have me smell all her spices and, and her, you know, the vanilla and everything she would be using. And I just loved tasting. I was like the, her little taste tester for everything. And so I loved using my palate. Um, and so uh, I had asked people, where can I, if I really want to learn about wine, where should I go? And everybody at the BFB, meaning the teacher as well as the fellow other students, said, you need to go to Suze La Russe, which is a famous, a lot of people outside of France don't know it, but it's a famous wine um university called the university of wine mm -hmm. and it's in the northern part of um of the southern end of the rhone valley so it's actually not too far from Gigondas, for example okay. um so it's at the, sort of at the cusp where montalima where it starts to go into the north even okay. though it's a, a while away um and so that's what i did and so i totally changed careers at that point and then um, at some point you made it back to the U.S. to work for Christie's for a while? Yeah, so when I finished that school, I did go back shortly to Nice, but because being American and then, you know, I had a work permit to do, to work at the university, but I didn't have a work permit to do anything else. So I thought, you know, it'd be easier to work, probably to get my start in the U.S. And mm -hmm. I found a job at Christie's. It was very funny uh i was just flipping through a wine spectator and at the back of it 
it sort of was an ad and it was not for a job, but it was basically, we're looking for your fine wine, you know, looking for fine wine collections. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'd love to have a consignment from you. And I'm just reading this and, and I'm just, you know, hmm. and it had two locations. One was New York and the other one was, uh, and I said, yeah, I don't want to be in New York because it's, it's a, a nice city, of course, it's dynamic, but I wanted something a bit more relaxed. And I liked my experience in California before. And so the other office was Beverly Hills. I'm like, yeah, I could live there. Um, <laughs> so I happened to call and they were hiring. So it was complete serendipity uh, because they, it was now that I had worked there, they didn't hire very often. So it was very, it was you know, meant to be kind of. Um, and then I ended up starting there a few months later as a junior specialist. And then worked there for four years where I was exposed, of course, to amazing wines. And it was it's sort of like coming to Burgundy to Bone for the first time as a wine region and having your first gig at Christie's. It was like these are the pinnacles of everything. So it was like after after I left Christie's, it was a bit of what do I where do I go from here? Uh-huh. I feel like I've started at the top from the beginning. So um, of course, there's lots of other you know avenues of exploration. But at the time, it was. You know, it was, where do I go? Uh, and I was fortunate to be able to have, um, to be exposed to the top of both areas as early on. How long did it take you to, uh, from the time you decided, I'm going to go for that NW to 2014? When did you start that process? And what was it that day where you said, yes, this is what I want to do? Well, I actually learned about the Master of Wine when I was uh, studying in Susan Mm -hmm. O'Rourke's. There was another student that told me about it. And of course, because I like to study and I like challenges. The second he said, there is such a title. And I was like, there's such a title. I was like, I have to do it. And that so that was in 1998 or 99. Okay. Um, And so this was before I finished, before I worked at Christie's. And so when I was at Christie's, Anthony Hansen, who was also at Christie's, but in London, mm-hmm. he was super nice and he's still very nice, of course, but he was very helpful. And he says, you know what, Robin, you really have to do the WSET while you're at Christie's. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, it will be supported. Uh, and so I did the level three, um, which at the time, the WSET was not developed in the U.S. It was all the only place that existed was the New York Center. Mm-hmm. Um, anywhere else it didn't exist. So I had to do everything self-study. So I did mm-hmm. level three in diploma and the diploma um, is, is embarrassing as it is to say, I didn't study much. <laughs> okay. And it was like a mini MW. It was one, you know, it wasn't like today where you have assignments and, you know, you have to check in regularly. It was like an exam and I studied sort of like crammed it the last two months before the exam because I was at Christie's. We worked literally sometimes 80 hours a week. So it was a bit tricky to fit in study time as well. Mm -hmm. Um, So I did do the diploma and then I finished in 2003. Um, And so then I moved to London in 2003. I'd left Christie's and this is where I said, okay, I want, I need to go into something a bit different. And so I ended up um, finding a job as a marketing manager for a fine wine broker called Fine and Rare Wines, which still exists. Mm-hmm. And um, it was after I settled, because I moved there in December 2003, and it was 2004 where I said, okay, now I now that I've been here a year, I've settled down here, it's been a year since I finished my diploma, I'm going to apply for the program. And, um, and, and then I started in 2005. Okay. So it took me quite a bit of time to finish the Master of Wine. Uh, I did take a little bit of time off. I took two years off in between um the first um we used to be called year one and year two but then they changed that because it takes a lot longer than than two years usually um so and then after i sat the uh the exam for the first time i passed the tasting straight away which was great and then i took another year off so i took off two years total and then um i just found it really when you work full time and I was a buyer and I traveled constantly, I found it tricky to be inspired to do the theory side. Mm. Um, and the reason I feel like I passed in the end was because I met a group of students who studied like all the time. And so that was inspiring. So it's, it's incredibly helpful to group with other students when you're by yourself trying to study 
it's hard to get motivated, especially when you feel like you have to know everything. So that's sort of what finally pushed me um, over over the the hump, so to speak, and then finally passed the theory side. It took me four to four attempts, so. though. Um, but it was, like I said, it was difficult because I traveled so much. And your MW thesis was on uh, whole cluster fermentation? Yeah, so I, my first um, dissertation topic was on Madeira, because I love Madeira, and I feel like Madeira is um, not as understood as it should be, considering mm -hmm. how important and spectacular it was in the past. Mm -hmm. And um, it had, because of uh, two importers, so you have um, Manny Burke of the Rare Wine Company in the U.S., Mm -hmm. and uh, as well as Bartholomew Broadbent in the U.S., mm -hmm. Madeira had a second life in the U.S. And I just thought, oh, why can't this happen in the U.K.? There must be different perspectives. And so I wanted to analyze a little bit of what the U.S. did to get it going again and maybe what the U.K. did. But I could never get a thesis, I'm um, sorry, my synopsis through. Mm -hmm. I did in the end, but then it was like rejected constantly. And so finally... I got so frustrated, I said, I'm changing topics. So I said, I'm going to pick a region that I know really well, that I have lots of contacts, and a subject that I um, am passionate by. And then therefore, I hope to be able to get through it quicker with less mm -hmm. hurdles. <laughs> Although there were plenty of hurdles as well with that one. But yeah, so I finished that. And um, fortunately, that I was the last group of dissertation submissions because they then, then changed to the, the research paper format. I was lucky enough to open a bottle of 1890 Madeira for a customer a few weeks ago. Uh, oh, wow. Amazing. They, they came into the restaurant and they were looking for a special bottle of wine and they had called ahead and so I had it all set up and we did a special cheese plate with things that were going to pair direct and they were able to give me a, a, a glass of this and it was amazing but the best part was everybody in the restaurant wanted to come and take a picture with the bottle after yeah. um, after they had finished and they were gracious to do this um, and there was a young uh, couple that had just completed uh, uh, their college to become uh, grade school teachers um, and the, the wife turned to the husband and said, we'll work our entire career and probably won't have a bottle like this. Um, and the gentleman sent two glasses and a cheese plate to their table and they were so amazingly happy. And, you know, uh, I'm sure they'd never experienced anything like it this in their life, but it was one of those magical moments that I'll remember for the rest of Yeah. Time. No, and what else is wonderful about Madeira is I bet you the entire restaurant could smell it. Absolutely. Yeah, well, Absolutely. you don't get that so much with other wines. A bit with sherry. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's just it's so perfumed. And mm -hmm. the it's caramel, like that salt caramel. And oh, it's just amazing. I love Madeira. Yeah. And, um, Me too. So you now live in Switzerland. And yeah. you are one of five MWs in the entire country. Is that is that right? Yeah, and I'm the only one in, um, there's only two of us that are not Swiss. Um, oh. <laughs> and, and I'm the only one in Ticino, so I'm in the Italian part. I'm about an hour from Milan mm -hmm. and about 25 minutes to Lake Como. Okay. And, um, I moved there for a job and, uh, I only stayed there for about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And then I started my own consulting company and just stayed there because at the, the time I sort of thought, well, I'm not sure if it makes sense to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, maybe I will eventually leave and mm -hmm. go to either a different part of Switzerland or France or somewhere. But, mm -hmm. yeah, at the moment, that's where I'm based. And I really must say, um, you know, it's, I'm torn because it's, it's a very beautiful area. And mm -hmm. I love being right next to Israel. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, so it only in, um, you know, uh, Alto Pimonte. That's only like an hour and 20. Oh. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, and it's, you know, I can go to th three hours. I'm in Verona. You know, it's, it's you know, maybe even less. It's great. So I love having access to Italy because, it's you know, it's uh, two and a half hours or something. I'm not in Liguria on the beach, you know, mm -hmm. by, by the, uh, Genoa. You know, it's, it's, it's a great location in that sense. It is a little bit farther 
from Burgundy because I'm at the sort of wrong end, <laughs> wrong end of Switzerland to make it easy. But it's a, it's a quite a, a fun area, and they too have wine there. It's much. It's only about seven percent of the country's production, mm -hmm. and it's uh, mostly Merlot based. Okay. So it's um, a little bit different, but it's kind of also nice that it's also in a viticultural zone as well. That's wonderful. How did achieving the Master of Wine change your life? What uh, what opportunities were presented to you at that point, and and what are you doing now? Well. I, to be honest, it was it was something that I wanted to do in the UK when I lived there also because is even though things have improved, I still think being a, a woman in wine isn't the most obvious, especially if you work in more fine wine. Uh, it tends to still be the old boys network. Uh, you know, a lot of places when in the UK um, tend to be a lot of, you know, men who are, you know, can be very charming and of course are very nice. But nonetheless, they went to private schools. You know, it's it doesn't it's the same. It doesn't have the same thing where women can easily just fit in. Mm -hmm. And so I did feel like, and also being American in a British, a very British institute, uh, would also help because at the time I didn't know I'd be moving to Switzerland, mm -hmm. and or anywhere else for that matter. And so uh, I felt like it would help me sort of, you know help me be taken a little bit more seriously by people who didn't know me uh -huh. uh, people who knew me and knew my job because i used to work for a very good wine merchant called good house and company uh -huh. and they still are very good and so you know that in itself was a role that i um i enjoyed very much and and so having contacts through them was great but if if i happened to meet someone who didn't know me i just felt like i i also i need something else Mm -hmm. And so since I became a master of wine, um, I'm fortunately, I do get regularly contacted by things. I would never be able to have started my own business, for example, as well. Mm -hmm. It would have been much more difficult to say, I'm a consultant, you need to hire me. Mm -hmm. um, because also in Switzerland, they'd say, well, who are you? But when I can say I'm a master of wine, the Swiss more or less understand. So that was super helpful. And then I'm also contacted regularly, you know, for started to participate as a wine judge in wine competitions. Um, I can now, it makes it so much easier to write articles for magazines like Decanter or Miningers or, or whomever, um, mm -hmm. Wine Searcher, you know. So it just, I still, one still has to prove themselves. It's not like, oh, you're a master of wine and oh, everybody just falls at your feet. It's not quite, <laughs> it's not quite like that unless your chances but see she's proven herself in other ways it's not just because she's a master of one so it's one of i view it and i have to sometimes tell other um people who are students mm -hmm. it's not the end all and be all it's kind of the cherry on the top so mm -hmm. it helps you to, you know definitely will help you once you have it but just because you have it doesn't mean you're suddenly like all your skills has improved like you know i was i'm a trained wine buyer if you have a master of wine, but don't have any um, experience being a wine buyer, don't expect to be hired as a, a wine buyer. You know, mm -hmm. you would hope not actually, because you need all those years of practical experience to be able to do to do the job correctly. The mm -hmm. fact that you are, a, you know, an experienced wine buyer or whatever one does, plus mm -hmm. a master of wine, again, that sort of it adds more structure, it adds more oomph, it adds the cherry to the top. So. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it definitely has helped me. It definitely has opened doors, but the most important is the experience, the practical experience I, I had beforehand. And, you know, I think that wine is a never ending pursuit of studying. Um, even though you got your MW in 2014, I'm guessing you're still learning new things about wine every day. Yeah, no, it's, it's, um, Absolutely. And it's it's one of those things where the world of wine has changed so dr dramatically since the beginning and W's. Um, and every year it's like there's a new there's new grapes, you know, not that they didn't exist before or maybe they haven't. There might be new crosses or hybrids. Um, mm -hmm. There's new regions. There's new this. There's new that. And also the, the wines you tasted last year are different this year. And so the the world is in a constant state of evolution. At some point, you know, when you're a student, um, 
you spend so much time studying, of course, and usually working. And but it's it's not uh, one cannot continue to study at that level, you know, because you go you go insane. Um, <laughs> everybody will be divorced if, if people have kids. Your kids won't even recognize you because you never see them. You know, it's it's you can't keep that up. It's okay for a short amount of time, short short meaning you know years, uh, but you can't do it for the rest of your life. Um, so at some point, most people tend to choose regions that they specialize in. Uh, there are still some generalists, but it's 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 overwhelming. And I think the generalists tend to be people such as educators or journalists, because uh -huh. they are given opportunities uh, to write about wines from all over or to educate about wines from all over. So if they do that more of like a full time job, it's much easier for them to become more generous to stay or, you know, yeah, more probably more like stay a journalist because when you do study for the MW, you, you kind of have to become one. But because my main job now is I do I'm a buying consultant, I have specific projects that I'm doing, so I can't just sort of wander freely all over the world <laughs> learning about things. You know, I now have to have make money. I have to apply my skills in a commercial context, mm -hmm. and so. I now have, I realize that as, as curious I am about the rest of the world, I mean, gosh, I was in Israel, Lebanon, um, you know, I was looking at all of my pre-COVID trips, you know, like Argentina, Chile, Uruguay. I mean, I did all those in two years, all mm -hmm. over the place, which is great. But at some point, um, you know, it, it, it feels, starts to feel a bit manic. And then it's, I feel like it's, it, for me, I needed to calm down and sort of say, okay, wonderful. I'm so glad I still want to do those things, but I feel more relaxed learning a bit more in depth about specific areas and then um, be able to use those skills. I still will work abroad, um, like with, um, with a broad context of subjects and regions. But um, it, you get sometimes pressure where people say, well, you're a master of wine. Don't you know all about Georgia or don't you know all about <laughs> South Africa or, or New Zealand or wherever? Mm -hmm. And it, it's, but you're a master of wine, you're supposed to. And it's like, yeah, that's like saying, Boris Becker, why can't you still win Wimbledon? You know, <laughs> it's a little bit like that. We're not saying I'm like a Wimbledon, you know, grand champion by any means, but it's sort of like you're trained to do this for a certain time. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, life goes on and you can't uh for most people at least for me i can't you know hold keep that up so i it's easier to then go deeper into sort of specific areas that i love like burgundy um barolo you know champagne uh yeah these are sort of some of my shushu the french call shushu regions that really inspire me and then it just i feel um like i can contrib contribute more because i can convey a deeper level of knowledge to other people as well we started this interview talking about that time in Bone where you were exposed for the first time to all of these wonderful wines and it kind of piqued your curiosity to start your journey. Since then, is there a, is there a magical bottle or moment where it kind of reconfirmed for you that you, you made the right choice? Well, to me, it's not, uh, yeah, there isn't really a specific bottle. There are moments where you taste certain wines and it's just, it just feels like, yeah, like magic is going through your body. Um, but what I really like about the wine, working with wine is probably the people and also the vineyards because, you know, you're in beautiful nature. Most wine regions are in, in stunning locations uh, and it's outdoors, you know, and so that's kind of nice. It's not like I am not a viticulturalist, so I don't walk through the vines all the time. In fact, when you're when I'm here in Burgundy in January and I see these poor people <laughs> <laughs> working in the vines all day long and it's absolutely freezing. Mm -hmm. uh, I just think, oh, my God, I can't do that. Those poor souls. Um, but they like it uh, probably for the most part. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's it's sort of the culmination of, of meeting such inspired people you know the wine world it's not like investment banking you know you're okay there's a few people who do incredibly well and bravo to them but most people don't you know make a huge salary uh this isn't you know where people are you know, plastic surgery or top lawyers or yeah investment banking 
where you might hate your job, but more, you know, like your, your salary is huge. It's not quite like that. It's much more of a lifestyle choice. And so you meet people who love what they do for the most part. And so that is inspiring in itself. And so when you meet a wine producer and he's so excited or she's so excited by, look at here, this is what I did. These are the grapes. This is my vineyards. These are the wines. And, and they can go on and on about the history of, of the vintages. And it, it's, you're kind of in awe because, you know, these are, you know, they're artisans. And so, and when you are in their presence, you know, it's an extraordinary experience. So being surrounded by people who, who love what they do, who love wine, um, that's what sort of reaffirms my choice. And of course, the wine itself, when you drink something beautiful, it's like, and then you, you understand it. You're not an outsider. Because I remember what it was like, not understanding, not, you know, looking at a huge selection of bottles. I mean, there's still times where I go into a wine shop and I'm like, or I look at a wine list in a restaurant and say, what is this? What are these wines? I've never heard of most of the producers, you know, because there's so many small producers and, and some shops or restaurants like to specialize in sort of off piste areas or lesser known producers. Mm -hmm. And so I, I still remember, you know, going into wine shops being completely lost. So I now like the fact that I can just, it's another level of, of understanding. So not only is it um, for me, a, sort of um, an emotional experience, but it's also intellectual. It's something that uh, keeps me stimulated, you mm -hmm. know, reading about why is the wine, you know, why is Volnay Kairi like that? <laughs> why does it taste like that? You know, and people are like, well, it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and the rest of it, who knows, you know? So <laughs> it's, 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 I love the fact that it always pulls you and quite, and you always question it. Um, you know, so it's, it's those things rather than, I suppose, a specific bottle or a single singular experience. Fair enough. Well, Robin, thank you so much for talking to me today and our worldwide following of day drinkers all around the world that uh, are going to benefit from your perspectives uh, and your personal journey to reach that highest level of attainment in, in our industry. And I really do appreciate your time. Yeah, no, it's been a pleasure. If, if I can add one more thing, Absolutely. Which, I, <laughs> which I do think will help students, is never stop questioning. Always ask questions. When I was a student doing the Master of Wine, we were in Bordeaux doing um, a visit. And I was asking, I was one of the annoying ones. I was like, what about this? What about this? What about this? And I had people behind me saying, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Enough, blah, 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 blah. They were, you know, kind of mocking me and they're trying to be funny. They weren't like really nasty, but they were, you know, trying to be funny. But I couldn't help it. You know, I had questions. I wanted to know. I, you have to be eager to get there. You have to keep going. I'm the only one that passed. They didn't, mm -hmm. you know. So while they thought, oh, too much, too many questions, you know, I'm the only one that passed out of, out of this group that was, you know, in the, the corner and, and talking about me I'd say, saying too many questions or asking too many questions. So to me, never, you know, always be curious, always ask questions. You know, of course, if the wine producer starts to get annoyed, sense that too and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> let it go. But that's what really drove me, um, you know, the, the constant seeking of knowledge, the constant seeking of answers. It's that sort of persistence, whether, you know, under, just overall understanding or failing a paper or failing an exam and then you just keep going you always have to say why 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 how can you you know i need to understand more so that's to me that was the key i think that helped me always be curious always find out what the possible answers could be and remember that day drinkers out there always ask the questions because she's the only one that passed. There you go. <laughs> In that group. <laughs> Fair enough. Robin, thank you so much. Yeah, it's been a so touch of pleasure, Kevin. Thank you, Robin, so much for giving us your perspectives on your personal journey to become a master of wine. I really appreciate the time and look forward to seeing you next time I'm in Europe. If you like this episode, please don't hesitate to give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to Day Drinking with Kevin. 
If you have ideas for future episodes, email me at daydrinkingwithkevin at gmail.com. Until next time, I say salute.